Notice that the stiffest tree most easily cracks, while the bamboo or willow survives by bending with the wind. It's a quote by Bruce Lee. I wanted to showcase something to you. So this right here is the perfect opportunity to show you what I was talking about in regards to what I was mentioning in terms of trees. You notice the weather is looking kind of crazy right now, right? Here's the thing about trees. I was uh, several years ago, 2009, nine years ago, uh, I was out in Vancouver. I can't believe it's been that long. So I was in Vancouver and we went to the Capilano Suspension Bridge Park which includes a lot of these massive trees. Now these trees, they're like, um, uh, they're like your redwoods, very similar in terms of size and grandeur. Like one of these trunks is so wide. Okay, so behind me here, this is Grandma Capilano. This is our oldest tree in the park. She's about 500 years old right now. For a Douglas fir tree, this is only about middle age though. They usually live to be around a thousand years old. But one of the things that's really fascinating about these trees is that this entire suspension bridge park is designed such that there's no bolts or anything like that that go into the trees. They're based off of pressure. And so one thing that they have to do, because the trees grow, they have to adjust the pressure uh, so that the suspension bridge itself doesn't grow into the tree, nor does the tree destroy the bridge. A tree house just like this. Uh, <laughs> signage all over the place to educate any of the viewers or the, uh, the visitors about the trees themselves. One of the things that they mentioned about trees, and this is in general, is that the swaying, right? The swaying of the trees as they go back and forth because of the wind is a stressor on the tree, meaning it causes you know, the tree branches on the inside for them to crack and break. And, uh, you know, and just like how when you go exercise and you go to the gym and you lift weights, uh, you, you get micro tears within the muscles of your body, but then your body goes in and heals it and becomes stronger. Similarly, when you're trying to get more flexible, right? Uh, part of, you know, some people, they don't have, uh, it might be difficult for them to get their, you know, leg up this high. And so in order to be able to do that, or even if you're trying to increase your flexibility, uh, you know, you're gonna feel stretch. You, and part of it is you're making tears in the muscle, right? So all of this, all of these stressors is uh, through the healing process, through the recovery process, causes you to become more flexible, more nimble, more mobile, uh, more, uh, more strong. So in the case of trees, if, they didn't face winds, they didn't face storms, then one of the things that would be very apparent is that these trees become weak. And so if they go through long periods of time without adversity, without storms, without winds, and then when a storm does come, the tree won't last, it will fall over. Get a load of this. And so, and that's one of the other things is that the tree, if it doesn't get wind and things like that, it tends to get stiff. And that's the, that's the thing about the Bruce Lee quote is like, you know, a tree that's stiff is gonna break against the wind, whereas a tree that's constantly facing uh, adversity, constantly facing storms and winds and things like that, they tend to live a lot longer. They tend to, uh, they tend to be able to grow. They tend to, uh, a lot taller. All of this goes towards the uh, strengthening of the tree, so. Let's just let this be a lesson for all of us is that the storms that we face, even Ramadan is a stressor, it's a physical stressor. It's a mental stressor, a means for us to get stronger uh, and expand our uh, you know, circle of comfort, so to speak, what we're able to endure. Um, and so part of it is allowing ourselves and be willing to uh, push ourselves beyond our comfort zones.
So here's the thing, so Bilal, for those of you who don't know, we've nicknamed him the Hungry Orphan. It's as if, like, he hasn't eaten before. Like, just to give you an example, Bilal, you know, he ordered a Grand Slam breakfast this morning. And I said, Bilal, we gotta go, we got, we're leaving in three minutes. And Bilal's like, don't worry, I'll be done before then. I don't think this boy chews. <laughs> like, you know how crocodiles, they just like, oh. So he just spoons the food into his mouth and I saw him take like this piece of candle of one shot and just dropped it into his mouth like he eats like that. So right, we were at, there's this suspension bridge and it's like really, you know, it's like a rainforest and you're walking through the trees and so on. We had a tour guide there and Bilal was beside me and the tour guide said, and Bilal obviously if you don't know, like he's hungry child but he doesn't eat all day long. He's got like just that Grand Slam breakfast that he eats in two minutes but he's like, he's a hungry child. So then um, this tour guide basically says that there are these like little type of bushes. Right here we have a huckleberry bush, this one here as well. So in a couple weeks I'll grow a small red berry that is edible. And then over here you can see there's even the start of a small tree growing. So that's a western hemlock tree. Now it will grow to be full size. So the hemlock tree got its name from the poisonous hemlock that killed the famous philosopher Socrates. However, this one's not poisonous, they just have a similar smell, so that's why I got it that, that name. This one is actually edible, works as a hunger suppressant. So First Nations used to eat it before going on long fishing or hunting trips in order to reduce their appetite. So Bilal immediately, like, ding, 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 he's like, food. So he asked the tour guide, is like, is, would it be all right if I eat it right now? You mentioned that the natives would eat that for hunger suppressant. Uh, would they like ground it up, mix it with a drink or something? Or? They just eat the needles, actually. Oh. So yeah, they just pull out those the, needles and eat them. So if we ate one now, would that... You could try one if you want. That's <laughs> one right there. Just this? Yeah. <laughs> That's a taste. So Bilal takes one, bitter. and everybody's like looking, he's like, it's bitter, it's bitter. And then I'm listening and we, as we continue along, and then I see Bilal going for some more. I'm like, Bilal, dude, calm down, you know, we'll, we'll get you some food and all that stuff. So he's like, I'm testing it, will it really suppress my hunger or not? And as I noticed him, and I know we shouldn't share sins and stuff like that, but Bilal was eating with his left hand. He had the camera in his right hand, and he was eating with his left hand, and I was like, dude, I probably didn't even say Bismillah when you ate that. But I didn't say anything. All quiet, the bush was gone. You know, what can I do about it? So then later on, Bilal asks this thought-provoking question. Now here's a question that comes to mind. Uh -huh. If someone were to eat hunger suppressant without saying Bismillah, then the shaitan would eat it. And eating with their left hand. Yeah, I realized that. <laughs> so you didn't say Bismillah, you ate with your left hand. Did it work or not? Bilal, did it work? I went four hours without eating anything. And I went back to eat with my right hand. <laughs> and I did say Bismillah afterwards. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> think yeah. he'll give me a piece of a leaf he ate so I can take a bite? <laughs> he ate like three of them. He kept oh, you ate the whole thing. <laughs> Let's dive.